This video is brought to you by Harking Technology Group. Introducing Harting, a German company that has been revolutionizing railway connectivity since 1945. As a 100% family-owned business, Harting evolved into a trusted partner over the course of 78 years. Their global presence and proven track record have earned the trust of railway operators and manufacturers worldwide. Their experts understand the unique challenges of the railway industry and that's why they offer a comprehensive range of cutting-edge connectors, cables and network components designed specifically for modern rail systems. Their renowned HAN connectors and high-performance cables ensure seamless and reliable connection, guaranteeing smooth operation from rolling stock to trackside applications. But Harting doesn't stop at connectivity. At Harting, they are actively driving railway technology forward. Their solutions support advanced features like train control systems, passenger information systems and onboard entertainment. By enhancing the passenger experience, they also prioritize safety and efficiency. Discover more about this company's portfolio by clicking the link in the description. Hello guys, welcome back to Railways Explained. Today we continue our story of the fascinating history of railway development in Great Britain. This time we'll be covering a period from the aftermath of World War II to the momentous era of rail privatization. This period was challenging for British railways, full of ups and downs, but it is mostly marked by the formidable challenges they faced. So, without further ado, let's dive right in by introducing a pivotal moment in this whole period, the adoption of Transport Act of 1947. The year 1947 stands out as a specific moment in the British transportation history. On January 1, 1947, the Transport Act came into force, announcing the birth of British Railways. This legislation officially introduced British Railways as the operating name for the Railway Executive of the British Transportation Commission. This was a significant departure from the past as British Railways assumed control over the assets previously held by the big four railway companies. Notably, some unique rail entities such as independent light railways, industrial railways and metros retained their independence outside the jurisdiction of British Railways. To fully understand these relations, we strongly recommend watching our previous video. Now, under the oversight of the BTC's railway executive, the British railway system underwent a comprehensive restructuring, dividing the nation into six distinct regions for efficient management. As World War II left a legacy of underinvestment and a neglected rail network, Upon its establishment, the British Railways Board's primary objective was the rehabilitation and modernization of rail infrastructure and replenishing the locomotives and rolling stock. At this point, it was more than evident that Britain's railways lagged behind in embracing the adoption of diesel and electrification. This reluctance towards dieselization, in particular, stemmed from a blend of political and practical reasons. The Labour government approached this transition with caution as it did not want to undermine the demand for domestic coal in favour of imported oil, fearing potential impacts on the balance of payments and employment rates. So, newly formed regions, essentially inheriting management structures from the Big Four, continued to rely on pre-war obsolete locomotive and rolling stock designs. Consequently, the railways were plagued by outdated equipment, frequent breakdowns and an urgent need for refurbishment. In response to these pressing challenges, the government prepared a comprehensive strategy known as the Modernization and Re-Equipment of the British Railways, commonly referred to as the Modernization Plan. Its crucial role was to emphasize that the government faced a stark choice at this point – modernize railways or witness their death. The Modernization Plan was published in December 1954. This visionary document aimed to propel the railway system into the modern era by elevating its speed, reliability, safety and line capacity. 
The ultimate goal was to attract passengers and freight back to the rails. The scale of the modernization plan was as impressive as its ambitions, with a projected cost of a substantial £1.24 billion, equivalent to approximately £30 billion today. At its core, the plan sought to retire the old steam locomotives and usher in a new era of diesel and electric trains. The modernization plan laid out an extensive agenda, calling for the procurement of a staggering 2,500 diesel locomotives. Furthermore, it proposed replacing a significant portion of pre-war passenger rolling stock with over 5,000 diesel or electric multiple units or new carriages. In the long term, electrification was envisioned for major trunk routes, vital secondary lines and remaining suburban systems. The initial phase focused also on acquiring 1,100 electric locomotives. Diesel traction was positioned as a transitional technology, bridging the gap between steam and electric power, primarily serving less prominent routes, shunting operations and specific freight movements. British Railways planned a pilot scheme to execute the modernization plan, ordering 171 diesel locomotives from six domestic manufacturers. These diverse designs were intended to represent various engineering approaches, with the most successful ones forming the foundation for large-scale orders over the next decade. However, political and economic factors prompted an acceleration in the adoption of diesel traction. In 1957, even before the first locomotive from the scheme entered service, total orders were increased to 230. Power categories expanded from 3 to 5, introducing new mid- and high-power types that was not initially considered. This led to a proliferation of locomotive designs. Instead of achieving standardization as envisaged in the modernization plan, British Railways ended up with 14 distinct locomotive designs from numerous manufacturers, each incorporating various features. This diversity unfortunately limited the anticipated operational benefits and cost savings. Many of the locomotives faced reliability and service issues resulting in poor availability. Thus, the modernization plan's initial vision to replace steam locomotives within a decade fell short. Ironically, in 1967, British Rail developed a national traction plan to rationalize its locomotive stock, retaining only the most reliable and efficient designs. The construction of new freight marshalling yards, a key component of the plan, also faced considerable challenges. The government had approved funds for 25 to 30 new or re-equipped marshalling yards. All but four were built within a few years, and a staggering 300,000 new wagons were ordered. But freight continued to shift to the road, so the rail freight business sank even deeper. The scale of the challenge was evident as British Railways, which had 1.14 million wagons in 1955, was discarding 8,000 wagons per week by the early 1960s. The Perth Yard, opened in 1962, might serve as a telling example. Initially bustling with activity, handling 1,200 wagons daily and serving 58 scheduled train arrivals, it soon faced the reality of declining traffic. Within only six years, the yard was on the brink of closure. The modernization plan had considerable potential, but its expenses exceeded earlier forecasts reaching £1.6 billion, or £33 billion in today's prices. Inefficient reputation and British Railways' debt of over £104 million in 1962, or £2.36 billion today, together with decreased traffic and revenue, a personnel shortage due to the shifting labor dynamics, and a degraded public image, all impacted that government lost its trust in railway management and stopped railway investments. By the way guys, as you might have noticed, we just added a join button option on our channel. As we intend to remain independent production, joining us there will not only enable you the access to exclusive content and engagement with our community, it will provide you with the opportunity to directly support our work. Click the join button, check out the deals and join us on board.
In response to the precarious state of the British railway system, the Conservative government introduced the new Transport Act in 1962. The Act marked a significant turning point by dissolving the British Transport Commission and establishing a separate public corporation known as the British Railways Board. This transition officially commenced on January 1, 1963. In 1965, the corporation underwent a rebranding, adopting the more straightforward name British Rail and introducing the iconic double arrow logo that symbolized the industry as a whole. Also, a non traditional savior arrived on the scene of British Railways, Richard Beeching, a businessman with a mission to rescue the failing rail system. His weapon of choice, a groundbreaking report that would become legendary, the Beeching Report. Published in 1963, the report delivered an evident conclusion. Substantial portions of the railway network were carrying minimal traffic and should be closed down. Beijing's numbers were staggering. Nearly half of the 17,830 route miles were deemed unworthy of modernization, carrying just 4% of the traffic. 3,368 stations generated only 4% of the parcel's business, and passenger coaches rarely left the station, where 2,000 coaches being used fewer than 10 times per year. Even the freight trains were running inefficiently, making short trips that could take days. Beaching's recommendations, which included the closure of 5,000 miles of track and 2,363 small stations, became known as the Beaching Axe. The report also advocated the electrification of major main lines and the adoption of containerized freight transportation to replace outdated and uneconomical wagon load traffic. Many of the closures outlined in the report were eventually implemented, reaching their peak in the mid-1960s and continuing into the early 1970s. By 1975, the railway system was rationalized to 12,000 miles and 2,000 stations. In 1965, Richard Beeching issued a less publicized report, the development of the major railway trunk routes, often referred to as Beeching II. This report highlighted the key lines deemed worthy of continued significant investment and did not recommend further closures. Instead, it outlined a 3,000-mile network for development. Like the modernization plan, Beeching's policy was based on a misconception, albeit a completely different one. That the railways could be made profitable if loss-making branches were closed, leaving a core network that could earn money. So, the Beeching's plan ultimately failed to achieve its intended objectives, bearing in mind that figures which were further accumulated during this period. However, in 1968, the Railways Act provided British Rail with a somewhat more stable financial foundation by raising its £1.2 billion of debt. Also, the focus was shifted from dismantling the network to modernization. Efforts to enhance railway performance gained momentum with the introduction of high-speed diesel train services. A significant milestone was the launch of the Intercity 125 high-speed train in 1976. This innovation brought swifter and more efficient travel and introduced the Intercity brand. It succeeded in attracting more passengers and boosting British Rail's finances. However, unlike the French approach of building dedicated high-speed lines, Britain chose to upgrade existing tracks for higher-speed travel. Another ambitious initiative was the Advanced Passenger Train Project, aiming to create the world's first tilting train. Yet, this project faced financial constraints, political pressures, and the premature launch of a prototype into passenger service before resolving technical issues. These challenges ultimately led to project's cancellation in the mid-1980s. Another scheme which did not see the light of day but on which much energy and considerable cash was expended was the Channel Tunnel Rail Link and the tunnel itself. The detailed plan was released in 1972 and work began, but after inevitable cost rises it was put on hold in 1975 and ended up being delayed for three decades.
The 1980s ushered in a period of profound structural reform for British Rail, bringing about sweeping changes to its organization and operations. These changes were a response to the evolving needs of the rail industry and a shift in how services were managed. One of the most significant changes was the abolition of the regional divisions. In their place, the system was restructured into distinct business sectors, each with its own specialized focus. The passenger sectors included Intercity, responsible for high-speed and express services catering to long-distance travelers, Network Southeast, dedicated to serving London commuter routes, and Regional Railways, tasked with managing regional services, connecting smaller communities and facilitating local travel. Similarly, freight operations underwent so-called vectorization. Therefore, we had train-load freight focused on handling train-load freight efficiently and moving large quantities of cargo. Then we had rail freight distribution, specialized in non-train load freight, facilitating the transportation of various goods. Also, there was freight liner, which geared towards intermodal traffic, offering flexible freight solutions. And eventually, rail express systems, which managed parcel traffic. The consolidation of maintenance and engineering works into a new entity, British Rail Maintenance Limited, streamlined these critical aspects of railway operations. As part of these structural changes, the iconic BR Blue livery, which had long characterized British Rail, gradually gave way to new liveries, signaling a visual shift in the identity of the railway system. Infrastructure maintenance had remained the responsibility of the regional divisions until the Organization for Quality initiative in 1991. This initiative marked a crucial transition, transferring infrastructure maintenance to the newly established sectors aligning with the broader structural changes taking place within British Rail. The 1990s brought a changing political landscape, with Margaret Thatcher replaced by John Major as Prime Minister in 1990. Despite the privatization of nearly all former state-owned industries under the Thatcher administration, the National Rail Network remained untouched. However, in the Conservative Party's manifesto for the 1992 general election, a commitment to privatize the railways was made. This commitment was rooted in concerns over decades of inefficiency, market losses, substantial subsidies, and inadequate management. The unexpected victory of Conservative Party in the 1992 election necessitated the development of a privatization plan before the railways bill was published the following year. The management of British Rail initially advocated privatization as a single entity, essentially creating a British Rail PLC. On the other hand, John Major favored a model reminiscent of the big four railway companies that had existed before 1948. However, the Treasury had a different vision, advocating the creation of numerous passenger railway franchises as a means to maximize revenue. Ultimately, the Treasury's approach prevailed. This marked the beginning of a new era in British Rail history, setting the stage for the privatization of the rail network. The subsequent changes in their impacts on railway performance, franchise operations and eventual renationalization of certain elements will be explored in detail in the next and last video of this series. That was all for today. If you haven't already, show your support for our channel by clicking that subscribe button. This really means a lot. And for those who want to take their support to the next level, check out our Patreon page linked in the description, or try out our new feature in the shape of join button. Until the next time, goodbye.